So our words from St. Francis are these this morning. Praise be to you, my Lord, through those who forgive for your love and who bear sickness and trial. Blessed are those who endure in peace, for by you, Most High, they will be crowned. One of the things we teach our children is when they've done something wrong or when they've hurt somebody, we tell them that they need to say, I'm sorry. But I wonder if we do them a disservice because we don't teach them the real work of repentance. We let them say those words, but how many of you said those to your brother and sister and went right ahead and smacked them again real soon after, right? Or said something unkind as soon as the I'm sorry was out of your mouth. How are we supposed to think about repentance? In our story today from Job, there's a line in it at the end of his dialogue with God that's, that our, the Bible you have in, in the pew says, I repent in dust and ashes. I took a different translation that says, I recant. Because when we think repentance, well, I don't know what you think, but when I think repentance, I picture those big barns in Illinois, right? Like the big, huge red barns. And on the side of the roof, it says repent. And, and it always made me squirm because I knew that it meant that they didn't believe that I believed in God. That they were asking me to repent because I didn't have the right relationship with God that they thought I needed. Um, yeah, my evangelical neighbors were very traumatic when I was little. So when I hear that word repent, I squirm because I'm not sure it's what God is actually calling us for. Um, so when I was thinking about how do we talk about repentance? How do we describe what it means to truly repent? And when you think about Job's story, what comes to mind? You remember the first part where he loses everything, right? All his children, all his animals, all his servants, everything is destroyed. And then there's those chapters in between. So from chapter four, until chapter 38, Job and his friends talk. But here's the thing. Job's friends say to him over and over again, you must have done something wrong. And you need to tell God what it is you did wrong, and this will all go away. And so they say that, like chapters worth of that. That you did something wrong. Just acknowledge it. Just say that you did something wrong. And it'll all be over. And it'll all be well. And Job, every time a friend speaks, responds, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't need to repent. I didn't do anything that would have caused my children to be killed. I know God is there, and I want God to come and talk to me. And then the next friend comes. Repent. You did something wrong. Say you're sorry. Tell God what it was, and everything will go back to being good. And Job again says, I didn't do what you're telling me I did. I have always been righteous. I have always been walking with God in my life. I didn't do anything wrong. And then Job starts switching. 
He starts talking to God. He starts saying, God, I need you to come near to me. I need you to draw near to me. I need you to be present with me so we can talk about what this is and what happened. And then the next friend comes. Joe, look, I know you're a good guy. But you did something wrong. Just admit it. Just admit that you did something wrong. And it'll all be over. And God will be back on your side. And at this point, Job isn't even speaking to his friends anymore. He's just demanding God to come and talk to him. He's demanding that God come and be present with him. That God come and hear his complaints. That God show him what justice and righteousness really is. And then this friend of the friends comes. And also speaks about God, about the wonders and majesty of God. And at that point, God has heard Job's prayer. And he appears. But what happens between his appearance and Job saying, I recant what I had said? What transforms in Job to change from believing that he has done nothing wrong to asking God, to telling God that I thought I knew who you were, but now, now that I've seen you, now that I've experienced you, now that I've heard what you had to say, now I get it. What made him then say, I recant and sit in the dust and ashes? So here's my answer for you. Every scholar for thousands of years has argued they don't know what's up with Job and what to do with this. So I've wondered, how do we talk about what true repentance looks like. And one of the people that comes to my mind always when we think about repentance is this rabbi on Twitter. Her name is Danya Rettenberg. And she has, every time um, the High Holy Days is coming, Yom Kippur, she talks about repentance and what does it look like and what does it mean and how do we practice it. And let me tell you, it's not a, I'm sorry. When she talks about repentance and what it means to practice repentance, she asks a lot of us. She asks a lot of us and demands a lot from us. That she says in the Jewish tradition to speak about repentance is to speak And to ask the questions about yourself. Who have you been? What within yourself do you need to repair? How have you handled things? What are the ways your choices have hurt others? How have you not lived as the person you wanted to be? And she says, those are the questions you ask yourself before you start the process of repentance. Can you imagine that? Like, this isn't an I'm sorry, a simple question. This is, like, if I've done these things that stick with you, because we all have them, right? Well, maybe not. I'm the kind of introvert who can remember the wrongs for forever. So I will have them on my dying bed. I'll say, oh, no, eighth grade, remember. But we all have things like that, times when we didn't mean to hurt our child, but it was one of those days and it was the last straw and you yelled because you were on empty. All of us have those moments. And so that's why she says, and when they begin the process of repentance, 
When they begin the process for Yom Kippur, bringing in the new year so that they can move to atonement, they have to start with asking that question about, have you always been the person you wanted to be? Are you the person you want to be? And how have you not lived up to that image inside? And so then she goes into the steps. The first step, confession. What have you done? Then you need to confess. What harm have you caused that you need to own? And then you don't move to the I'm sorry. She says, after you've confessed it, you have to figure out what in you needs to change. You have to do your own work. You have to do the things to educate yourself, to transform your inner self. Then you can move on to the third step, which is to make amends. Meaning the right wrong that you did, how is it you can you can make it right? So one of our examples is if you broke somebody's bone, did you pay for their bone to get fixed? If you hurt somebody with your remarks, and it isn't somebody that you have a personal relationship, can you donate money to an organization that works for justice for that group of people? How can you make amends? And then she says, now you can get to the apology, all right? You've already done three steps worth of work. Now you can apologize. But she says, this isn't an apology for you. This is an apology that puts the victim first. It's about what they need, what they need to hear, how their life and struggle is centered that the apology is about the person you harmed, not about you. That's tough, right? To think about the apology not as, as you can just say, I regretted what happened. You have to think about how they can hear it. How can they accept it? How can they see that you have transformed. To say, I'm sorry. It's good in the first step. But it needs to be an apology that is meaningful. And we've seen that a lot in the last few years, right? Because every time we learn about a man who misbehaves, he gives us a paragraph, and that paragraph is never about the victims, right? It's never about how they have been harmed, how their lives have been impacted. It's always about, I didn't realize I was doing something wrong. And now that I know, I hope that you can let me have my job back. Right? Like it's a paragraph that's about them getting their job back, not about the victim who has been hurt. And that's why she says, when we think about repentance, we need to really think about it as a deep spiritual practice that is about changing our whole selves. And after you have apologized, you will know if you have truly repented because the next time you're in that same position, you will behave differently because you've changed yourself. And that, at that point, 
is when you move to atonement, meaning your relationship with God. That point after you have changed and transformed yourself is when you move into your relationship with God and can talk to God about that transformation. She makes repentance sound beautiful and hard all at the same time, right? Because she makes you look at yourself, take a deep inner look at who we are and how we can be different. And you can see that in Job's story. Because in the next paragraph after Job talks to God, God talks to the three friends. And he says to them, y'all said a lot of words. I heard you say a lot, but you didn't speak about me. You didn't speak rightly about who I am. And so I want you to turn to Job. All right, so then there's this whole slaughter of, slaughter of cattle and burnt offerings, but we'll ignore that part, the vegetarian up here. And then ask him to pray for you. That those friends go through the process in one paragraph, right? But if we take the rabbi at her word, it's a process that requires inner work, right? That Job's words of prayer for his friends, his act of forgiving them so that God can fix the relationship with his friends, took a lot. Because it does take time to go get your cattle, right? He had the chance while they were gone to think about did he want to heal the relationship? Did he want to believe that they had changed and transformed? Did he want to say that prayer to God? St. Francis wants us to believe that that's who we are to be, people who forgive and repent and transform. And so... I told you when we started this series a little bit about how this poem came into being, that Francis wrote it at the very end of his life. Well, the last two verses, the verse we are dealing with, the, the section we're dealing with this week and the section for next week, he wrote at, after he had written the part about creation. And in the verse he wrote today, he wrote this part about forgiving others. Forgive for my love. Because he watched as in his city, the bishop and the mayor were fighting with each other. And so the bishop excommunicated everybody that had to do with the mayor. And the mayor told everybody that was with him not to have any dealings with the bishop and the bishop's surroundings. So basically, Assisi was at war, right? The religious side and the political side were fighting with each other. and Nobody was allowed to interact. And that's when Francis wrote these words. Praise be you, my Lord, through those who forgive for your love, who bear sickness and trial. Blessed are those who endure in peace for by you, most high, they will be crowned. So the story is, the apocryphal word is, that Francis, in the midst of this drama, decided to bring them both together to hear this song. And so he sent one of his, his monks to them and invited them to come to Francis's church, to come and hear this new song that had been created. And so the one of the best singers among his monks starts singing. 
And then the rest of the group would repeat the verse. And then they would sing. And they kept getting closer and closer. And as they were singing, the bishop got up and has tears streaming down his eyes. This is why I say it's probably apocryphal. And the mayor saw this and got up and had tears streaming down his eyes. And at that point, that is when they sing those words. Those words that he wrote specifically for them. Be praised, my Lord, for those whose great pardon for love of you and bear sickness and tribulation. Blessed are they who bear them in peace, for by you, Most High, they shall be crowned. Francis' greatest desire was to bring people together, to bring peace amongst warring factions, to change how they saw and felt and experienced the world and everything around them. And so I'm sure this story is apocryphal because you know they probably made well and then argued with each other again the next day, right? But that's our hope. When we hear these words of scripture, when we experience the presence of God, that we too can be transformed, that our insides can break open and experience God in a way we hadn't experienced God before, that we can say those words that France, that Job says, I had heard of you, but now I understand you. Now I get it. I understand who you are. And who you are has reminded me that I can change and transform, repent, turn around, turn back, become part of who God has called you to be. I invite you to think about your journey of repentance this week. How can you be transformed? How can you experience the God who you've heard of, but now you feel? Amen.